Okay, cool. Okay. Hey, everybody. Sorry. Uh, I'm a little late. Um, thank you guys all for coming today. I'm really excited to be able to present this conference to you guys. We've been working really hard to put this together. Um, and thank you all for coming. I'm very, very glad that you're here. This is going to be um, the first day of a two-day conference on applications of AI and AI infrastructure. So I'm sure that everybody has seen in the last few years the rise of AI and how important it's become, and also the last four years of the importance of AI infrastructure, especially through MLOps and data. Um, for today's conference, we're going to be uh, having a few speakers from some of the biggest, um, best, most cutting edge startups that are working in the AI space. Oh, someone says they can't hear me. Uh, am I just talking like into space? That's not good. You can hear me? Okay, Talia, you can hear me. Um, can everybody else hear me? Is there anybody? Okay, 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 cool. Everybody else can hear me. Okay, cool. Um, Katya, um, I hope that you can hear me. I don't, I don't know how to help you from here. <laughs> okay. Oh, you can hear me now. Okay, cool. Um, <laughs> so yeah, um, and I, I wanted to give a big shout out to uh, AI Camp, and um, yes, I can post a schedule. Uh, I want to give a shout out to AI Camp and Bill uh, for helping me uh, host this and for letting us use the the Zoom room for this. Um, after, so today's first talk is going to be from Ultralytics. Um, originally we're going to have Glenn, Glenn come speak, but he is, uh, losing his voice. And so we're going to have Ayush, uh, who is an ML engineer at Ultralytics come and speak in his stead so that he can recover. Um, and we wish him a speedy recovery. Uh, and then after that we will have, uh, so they're going to be talking about State of the art uh, with Yellow V5. Actually, I think they just released Yellow V8, so it might be about Yellow V8. Um, Talia, can you talk to this in the chat? Um, and then after uh, Ayush comes and speaks for Ultralytics, we're going to have Miriam Santos. She's going to come speak on behalf of Y Data. Uh, y Data is a data platform uh, for machine learning, and she's going to be talking about the importance of data quality in healthcare. Uh, and healthcare is a very, very big field that we are applying AI to, and uh, there's a lot of new um, technology in that space. Um, somebody's messaging me. Ah, um, and then afterwards, I will speak on the applications of natural data processing in um, text and uh, for text applications and what you can do with that. So my background is in natural language processing. Um, and I've been working in this space for a while now. I uh, created an API for text processing. I've worked with a few speech to, uh, speech to, text, yeah, speech to text companies. Um, and we'll be talking about uh, the ways that you can apply natural language processing to multiple different fields. Um, and then after that, so that'll be uh, up to 11.30. And after 11.30, we will move to uh, Discord where you can jump on and get into smaller uh, groups for networking. Um, and you can get to meet uh, some of the speakers or some of the other attendees of the conference and you can get to connect um, and learn more about what you guys are all doing. Um, so that will be from 1130 until, um, you know, whenever you are tired of chatting with people. Um, and then that will be today's uh, schedule. Tomorrow, we will have uh, four speakers. And tomorrow's schedule also starts at 9. And hopefully, uh, we will start on time tomorrow. Um, and we'll have a talk from Haley Yoon, who is the CTO of IO21. And that is a software uh, company in Dubai. She, is, she was one of Forbes' uh, She's Next finalists. Um, and she's going to be talking about your tech career in general. And that'll be a 30 minute talk about uh, how you can uh, forge your own tech career and to take your own steps towards um, creating the career of your choice. Uh, and then after that, we'll have a talk about ML monitoring from Sage Elliott. Sage is a technical evangelist at 
Y Labs, and they do ML monitoring or ML observability. And this has been a big space in ML ops recently. And this explains your models and what they're doing. And this is really important so that you can understand what's going on with them. Um, then we'll have a talk about getting your data uh, machine learning ready from Jennifer Prenke. She's the CEO of Electio, and they're a data prep ops company. And so data prep ops is a specific uh, subsection of data ops where it is focused on preparing your data for machine learning use cases. Following that, we'll have uh, a talk from Michelangelo Mazeshi. He's um, from Goliath AI Consulting. And so he helps people, uh, they help people um, implement AI solutions. Um, and this is especially important as, you know, we go into 20, the later 2020s, as more of these companies are going to be looking to implement AI solutions. And he's going to be talking about understanding semantic models in natural language processing. Uh, so Michelangelo is one of the top thousand uh, AI writers on Medium, and he has been for a few years. He's one of the thought leaders in this space. Uh, and then after that, we'll I'll come back and just, you know, give a little, little statement about the conference and uh, thank you guys all for coming again, and um, we will start our presentation for redefining state of the art with YOLO V5 and YOLO V8 in uh, two minutes here, once I can find Ayush. Yeah, I, I'm here. Uh, I actually, ah. yeah, I'm, I'm the co-host now, so should I just start uh, my yeah. video? And Okay. Yeah, you can start now. I'm going to mute myself. I'm going to uh, get off video as well. All right, perfect. Uh, okay, I'll just share my screen. All right, uh, welcome to this talk by Ultralytics. Uh, I'm Ayush, I do ML here at Ultralytics, and the title of this talk is Redefining State of the Art with YOLO V5 and Vision AI. In this talk, we'll cover some real-world problems uh, that uh, we provide tools and solutions to tackle. So let me just set the context uh, for what we mean when we say redefining state of the art. Generally, all technologies have a journey from R&D uh, to the hands of users. But the technical metrics only cover certain aspects of it. When we say redefining state of the art, we take a holistic approach and we measure all of the things from the metrics, technical metrics, to the ease of use and how easily that they can be deployed to solve real world problems. Now, to kick off this talk, let's start with the question What would you change in your world? And this is a very open-ended question, right? It can be a problem that you'd like to solve or something that you would like to see more of, or you'd like to build something that doesn't really exist. We have some pointers that will help you or that will inspire you to ask this question or think of something for your own. 2016 was the warmest year recorded. So this is the data from combined, uh, this, this data, data is combined surface temperature anomalies uh, from NASA. And this, this is a general problem that we see in our world, right? Uh, increasing temperatures, every year we see a uh, uh, rise in temperatures. Now this is a grad this gradual rise uh, creates a lot of problems for a lot of people in different uh, geographic locations. For example, it can cause uh, ice caps to melt, uh, reducing uh, land area for people to live. This is one, one such example. Now you have to think about, what we have to think about here is how these problems can be solved using AI and technology today. Another such statistic is every year, 10 million tons of plastic suffocate our marine ecosystem. Now there have been measures taken to reduce this problem. For example, uh, one, such, one such attempt is introducing paper straws, uh, which are sort of dissoluble in water so that they don't really uh, affect the life of uh, the marine ecosystem. But this, this is just like drop in the ocean, right? Uh, the problem of this scale has to be tackled on both ends. We also, 
not, we, we cannot only just uh, provide solutions for these things. We also have to sort of uh, tackle this problem by removing the waste that already is in the in our marine ecosystem. Coming to healthcare, which is one of the largest uh, markets in the world. The statistic here is shocking. 50% of the world's population lack basic medical services. Now, there are various reasons for it, but these can be broadly classified into two. One is the geographical reason where a lot of technologies haven't reached far areas of the world, but other is socioeconomic that a lot of, uh, lot of population cannot afford these medical services. Now, the stat here is that 100 million people are pushed into extreme poverty due to health expenses each year. Now, can technology help us here to not only flatten out the cost of healthcare, but to also make sure the technology is widespread? Another statistic here is 2.3 billion people, roughly more than one fourth of the world population, lacks access to adequate food and nutrition. Now, there are various ways to solve this problem. One such example is, can, can we use technology to reduce wastage? Because another shocking stat that we don't have here is a lot of food uh, is actually wasted, right? So can we, can we use technology to predict the, uh, the demand of food so that not a lot of food is wasted and can be used for these people? So one such fact is that these are not new problems. We have been facing these problems throughout history. But what's possible today with technology is that we have means to create solutions or to actually, uh, to actually start creating solutions for these problems. We might not be able to solve them uh, in one go, but at least we'll reduce the, uh, the amount of people affected by these problems, right? Now coming to the solutions that we offer, Ultralytics, YOLO v5, and we'll talk also about YOLO v8 that we just released, has one fundamental principle. We try to make artificial intelligence easy for everyone. You don't have to be a developer, a machine learning engineer, or an expert to use YOLO v5. And we are continuously working on this mission to make it easier uh, every day. Here are the solutions that we offer. Classification, detection, and segmentation. Just to introduce the problem set here is that classification, classification tells you whether or not a particular image contains a particular object. Detection takes it a step further by localizing that object. As you can see in the second image here, you see the bounding boxes. Those bounding boxes basically contain the image, so they give you the coordinates of the limits of the spread of that particular object in, a, in an image or in a frame. Segmentation takes it a step further by classifying each pixel in an image. So you can see in the third image, you'll see that every pixel has been colored, which means that it can give you the exact boundary of, of an object. This is a lot more accurate. Here's a quick example of our latest state-of-the-art YOLO model performing real-time instant segmentation with the detection. So you can see this, is, this uh, example is predicting not only the bounding boxes, but also uh, the segments, which is the pixels. Now, with YOLO v5 and YOLO v8, it's possible to get these results with a click of a button, with just one single command. And this is uh, the real power of YOLO v5. This is what we mean when we say redefining state of the art. You don't have to be an engineer. You don't have to be a technical person to actually get these results. You can just visit our repository and get these results in less than 30 seconds. Now we've seen the problems. We've seen some of the ways that we provide to solve these problems. Now let, let us see if some of these problems that we've discussed before can be tackled by the tools that we provide.
can we detect cancer in real time? YOLO V5, or more specifically, YOLO V5 X model has achieved 96.5% accuracy in detecting cancerous tumors in various competitions. So if you see at the top, you, we have this competition, best tumor detection and classification in mammogram images using modified YOLO V5 network. YOLO V5 has acted as a base for computer vision research uh, for more than two years now. There's, there have been a lot of solutions and research and development processes taking place on top of YOLO V5 architecture, as well as our uh, dedicated YOLO V5 repository. Similarly, you see other two examples where they detect diseases quite accurately using YOLO V5 models. Remember the second problem that we saw earlier was uh, 10 million tons of plastic uh, that got submerged in our ecos uh, marine ecosystem every year. Can we, how can we start to tackle that problem? YOLO V5S model achieved 93% predict, 93% accuracy in detecting plastic. There was this effort called deep plastic that aimed to detect plastic in our marine ecosystem and automate the process of actually uh, taking it out of the of our oceans. So here in this video, you see the examples of YOLO V5S model in action. You can see how easy it is and how fast and accurate it is to deploy these models and build this project. Can we stop the spread of forest fires? Here's an example of YOLO V5S model predicting forest fires with more than 80% accuracy. Forest fires is especially difficult to track because by the time the authorities are alerted, a lot of damage has already been done, right? So, but, but if we have this solution of some kind, which automatically informs or, uh, or sort of alerts the authorities about the forest fire, action can be taken much earlier to contain these. And hundreds of thousands of trees and wildlife can be saved uh, due to that. Now, can we help businesses? Now, this statistic that we have here is that there's a potential of saving $500 million uh, a year with YOLO V5. Another real-world application of YOLO V5 is this application called Bolin. They use YOLO V5 to create an application that assists football players to track their skills and see their development. You can use this application to track a particular area that you want to work on or other statistics about your play. Another company using YOLO V5 is Sovit. It has helped 35,000 small scale farmers in Africa by using YOLO V5. Here are some other applications that our users have built on top of YOLO V5. On the left, you see with, uh, vehicle detection and tracking. So tracking takes detection a step further. It assigns IDs to every object that is detected. And so th their trajectories can be tracked in a particular frame. So you can basically create a path of uh, how a, an object changes its position throughout uh, the feed. On the right, another example that got really popular during the COVID is detecting whether a person has whether a person is wearing masks or or if they're wearing masks properly. Below, you see a lot of other examples of YOLO V5 being used in retail, in healthcare, in transportation, and in other real world problems. So 
Our repositories are available on GitHub, github.com stress ultralytics. Here are some stats. We've got 46.3 thousand stars accumulative across all our repositories. We have 100,000 plus users visiting our repositories per month, and we've got 1 million views uh, per month, more than 1 million views. As I said, our mission here is to make AI accessible to everyone, not just engineers, researchers, and developers. And we take this mission very seriously, and we are developing other platforms to address this issue. We have a product called Ultralytics Hub that is in, in development phase, which takes the YOLO v5 approach step further. Remember with YOLO v5, one of the greatest accomplishments was its simplicity. But still, you had to use GitHub. You had to download a lot of things uh, and set up your environment. With Ultralytics Hub, we've taken this a step further I'm making this a one-click GUI platform where you don't even have to set up anything uh, on your own system. We'll take care of it on cloud. It's a we're developing it as a SaaS platform with, where, with just one click of a button, you can train a model, label data sets, and deploy them in real-world devices. Similarly, on the other end of the spectrum, to make things easy for developers, we have launched a new framework called Ultralytics. And on top of that, we've built YOLO v8 as a proof of concept. And YOLO v8 achieves state-of-the-art real-world performance in terms of both accuracy and speed. So what is Ultralytics Hub all about? It's a complete loop of solutions. It has solutions. All of these, all of these computer vision problems starts with data. The first step always is that you have to source the data. You have to label it, you have to get it from somewhere, you have to uh, augment it according to your task. Ultralytics Hub supports all of these tasks end-to-end, -end, and you don't have to be a technical person to do all of these things. It, it gives you access to state-of-the-art models. It's simple to use, and it's deployment agnostic, which means that you can deploy it on any of the platforms, popular platforms, uh, such as uh, your smartphones, your edge devices, or even on cloud. It's a no-code solution. As I already mentioned, you don't have to be a technical person to use it. And with that comes, comes the advantage that no prior experience, either in Python or in AI, is necessary to use Ultralytics Hub. Here's a simple workflow. You upload your data, you train a model with a click of a button, and then you just simply deploy it on a real world device. Okay, so that brings me to the end of my talk. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions if there are any. Okay, uh, I'll take this. I guess I sh I'll start with the question that I have in front of me. Um, okay, this question by Pranjal. Okay, uh, this isn't really a question. This is uh, we can we can talk about these uh, this later on if you connect with me on any platform. Uh, Yujan Tang asks, oh, he's the host. Could you walk us through an implementation? Uh, what exactly could you describe more about what you'd like to see? Yeah, um, I think it would be cool. I think we have some time left here. I think it would be great if you could just uh, walk us through like uh, an implementation or maybe talk a little bit about um, how to use RoboFlow for data or clear or comment for observability or um, any of the other uh, kind of like parts of the ecosystem that would be required to implement uh, Yellow V5 into uh, an application style um, uh, implementation. Sure. Okay. Um, so there's a lot of things about uh, Yellow V5 that make it great. One of the things is that we provide solutions not only for 
training, but we've uh, at every step we've uh, partnered uh, carefully with companies uh, in best in their domains. So for example, if you're working on uh, YOLO v5 or YOLO v8 models, the one thing that you will see when you're developing machine learning models is that you'll, you will have to iterate a lot on, on the processes, right? So you have to run multiple experiments with different hyperparameters with different models to see what works best for your um, uh, problem. So in, in that case, you need collaboration, you need experiment tracking. So in terms of experiment tracking, we have partnered with uh, multiple companies. Right now we support Comet and Clear ML. And similarly, uh, when you uh, when you work with, uh, I cannot actually stop sharing uh, because I have to. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I was going to show you. Yes. All right, this is, this is what we call uh, YOLO v5 uh, integrations loop, right? So starting with data sets, uh, we have partnered with RoboFlow so that you can source and label your data sets. And that's the first step in every, every problem, right? Next step is essentially training. So here you can log your experiments and view them in real time in ClearML or Comet. And then you can also collaborate in your teams. We also partnered with Paperspace to provide GPU supported notebook platforms. Again, notebooks are essentially used uh, as an easier means to get started with uh, training. And then moving on to deployment, we support almost all of the uh, deployment platforms uh, on edge devices or on mobile devices. So some of the ones that mentioned here are TensorFlow, PyTorch, uh, Torch Lite and Onyx, and even uh, with our Autolytics Hub application, we support deployment on uh, mobile devices, both Android and iOS. Now, deployment is not the end of the story. You also can, uh, in in most problems, you'll you'll find that you have to optimize your models further down the road uh, to sort of uh, optimize them for speed uh, and also to suit. For a uh, suit, suit the model for a particular device. For example, not all devices, especially when we talk about edge devices, can handle large models. So you have to quantize or prune the model. For that, we have partnered with Neural Magic, and they've provide uh, they provide built-in solution for uh, quantization of YOLO v5 models uh, that that dramatically reduce the size of the model without uh, uh, by, by without you know taking away all of your accuracy. Uh, so this is basically what YOLO v5 uh, integrations loop looks like. A lot of things that we provide uh, are complemented by our carefully chosen partners uh, so that in the end, the mission here is that the users should have the most seamless experience. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. Oh, so the question by Pranjal Sharma, uh, can you tell us uh, how is the compatibility of YOLO v5 with ROS2 CV bridge? Uh, so currently we don't support that device. The, the edge platforms that we support right now are mostly Jetson um, and anything that you can work with Onyx. Uh, so we basically decide uh, what we like to support based on the number of feature requests that requests that come in. If we see a lot of feature requests for ROS2 device, we'll definitely think of building uh, an integration for that device. Okay. All right, I think there are no more questions. Uh, what's, okay, there's one more. What's the cost of it? Uh, Okay, another question. Can I connect with you to gain more clear picture of this? Uh, sure, yeah. Uh, you can connect with me. 
What's the cost of it? Uh, the idea, uh, the YOLO V5 uh, is a free tool. You can uh, use it for anything you like to use, any project. Uh, it comes with GPL3 license. Uh, and so, so it's like completely open source. It's totally free. Why did it release YOLO V8 after YOLO V5? Ah, it's a good question. Uh, so YOLO V8 V was released after YOLO V5 because YOLO V6 and V7 were already released uh, by uh, different labs. Uh, and in fact, YOLO V8 is, it comes with, with its own framework. Uh, what is the website link? Uh, I'll just put this in the description. All right, I'll just wait a few seconds more if there are any other questions. I think we have a little bit of a few minutes left. Do you want to talk about um, what what happened with the first four iterations of YOLO? So we have basically uh, Glenn, our founder, implemented uh, YOLO V3 first as his personal project. And that got really famous. That implementation is still the most famous implementation of YOLO V3. Um, and then while he was working on YOLO V3, uh, in his personal branch, uh, YOLO v4 came out by a different lab, again, just like YOLO v6 and v7, and he had better results. So he open sourced a, a new repository called YOLO v5, and then he worked on all the feedback that he received, and then it became what it is today. And so for the last couple of years, we've mostly focused on the ease of use aspect of the repository and not really uh, on making it the best model uh, accuracy wise. Um, but later this year, uh, later last year, we decided that we want to put more effort into research and development. And so we built a, a new framework from scratch that that is called Ultralytics. And on top of that framework, we built YOLO V8 models. Now, when, we, when, when I say we built a new framework, uh, that framework is capable of supporting all, all types of models. So it already supports YOLO v3, YOLO v5, and it has the capability to support any version. It's just a matter of time. Um, and also, uh, it can support non-YOLO models. Uh, okay, that's not really a question. All right. Uh, yeah, that's that's pretty much it. The story of of uh, YOLO v5. Uh, another question that we have from Chris Franklin is: Do you deploy your DS projects as web app in Streamlit? Uh, I have worked with Streamlit, but I don't really uh, use it anymore. Uh, yeah, how does YOLO v5 get implemented on healthcare images, microscope images, MR scans, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? Uh, yeah, so there have been many. Kaggle competitions where people have uh, worked on similar problems, as you mentioned, you know, uh, scanning extra images and uh, you know detecting a particular region uh, or a particular abnormality. So basically, the idea here is that YOLO v5 can solve any of the localization problems. So whether it's about detecting uh, in, or any region of interest, which is like ROI uh, in in technical terms, or something that's abnormal, uh, which is what you do when you detect diseases and things like that. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. I, okay. Thanks, Ali. Yeah, I think there are no more questions now. Uh, should we wrap this up? Um, <clears throat> Senda has one more question about the healthcare images. 
microscope images, MR scans, x-rays? Yep. Yeah, so I just answered that. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, okay, so we can wrap this up. <clears throat> um, thank you for your presentation, Ayush. That was great. I definitely uh, learned a lot about YOLO and um, the history and its implementations. And I loved the videos that you had on your slides. They were super cool. Um, next, we will have Miriam uh, present. <clears throat> Miriam is a data advocate, developer advocate at um, Y Data. Miriam, uh, I'm sure you can introduce yourself as well. Are you here? Ah, yes, there you are. Okay, mm -hmm. cool. Um, so I will let you take it from here and remute myself. Okay, sure. Um, hello, everyone. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on whether your time zone is. Right now in Portugal, it's cloudy, cold, and it's like about 6 p.m. Um, so yeah, as Eugene was saying, I am the, the data advocate here at Y Data and at the Central BI community. And today I'll be speaking a little bit about uh, data quality uh, in healthcare. So um, the agenda for today is essentially, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about me and why did I fell in love with this kind of topic. Also how AI is becoming so transformative for healthcare domains and why a particular crucial aspect of it is to guarantee that it has sufficiently high quality. Um, why domains, healthcare domains are particularly so complex? What type of data issues may we find? And then we will explore a little bit the use case on a real world um, healthcare domain with pandas profiling, which is one of our uh, open sources that has just recently hit like 10, 10K stars on GitHub. Uh, so I'll show you around how to work with it. Um, so basically I started uh, my, my path as a biomedical engineer. I specialize in clinical informatics, bioinformatics. And this journey led me to work with um, multidisciplinary teams like uh, working on a recommendation system. I think my first was actually a, a patient-oriented model to um, check the survivability of liver cancer patients. And then I started to understand that data literacy and data quality is really essential for you to be successful with your applications. I then followed my PhD on intelligence systems, studying a lot of different data characteristics or quality issues that are really um, could be applied to any domain, but uh, why they uh, why, why they are particularly interesting for healthcare is one thing that I would like to explore with you further today. Uh, so this is my main topic of research, uh, data-centric AI, data processing, data understanding, how they used to call it before, meta-learning, which is also related, and now all falls under the scope of data-centric AI. Uh, so as you probably know, if you are, working in applications, uh, AI has been introducing a lot of advantages for the way we used to do medicine previously. So it boosts kind of um, the, the general clinical guidelines that we had, and now we can use it for practically everything, uh, all spheres of medicine, either preventing disease itself, so like continuously monitoring our activity, uh, making us more mindful, having home companions, changing lifestyles, surgical robots, augmented reality either for learning or for visualization, for instance, of complex surgeries, uh, human computer interfaces. I saw recently one that people use glasses to actually translate in real time for people who couldn't hear, uh, radiology tools, wearables, you name it. So there are a lot of courses and specializations now coming up. Um, and basically the current challenge is that healthcare faces now is not whether technology will become transformative, but is actually on the adoption. So uh, how do we make both patients and clinicians adopt AI at scale? How do we face regulations? How do we face um, ethics problems and so on? Um, and one of those things that I'll not be focused on that particularly, one of the things I will focus on is this idea that if we have massive amounts of data, we can get the most of uh, our intelligence from that. And this is not true. 
uh, the thing is most often we generalize big data as quality data and this is a mistake that will make us uh, develop bias and unfair models rather than quality models. We are now coming to terms both in academia and in industry that smart data rather than big data may be more impactful for our applications than the contrary. So in data, we have a lot of issues. This can either occur in the acquisition and transmission collection process, but they can either be specific characteristics of data that are very connected to the domain itself. So they may not be an error per se, but they are somewhat complicating for the, the decision process in a later stage. So the idea here is to explore which types can be uh, present for healthcare data. And healthcare data is really like a perfect storm. Um, it may or may not create large amounts of data. Why do I have a, a question mark here? It's because yes, for instance, you, you are using a sensor, you get perhaps uh, a lot of data produced within milliseconds. But if you are under a situation where you have a rare disease, you may not have like even enough worldwide cases to study from. Um, these data are normally handled by different people within the institutions. They are collected from different sources. We, we're talking about heterogeneous data, heterogeneous features, and structured data because you can have audio, video, image, text, sensor. You can also have, of course, structured data and databases and so on. Um, and you have this issue of what is exactly coming from acquisition, transmission, and storage that can come up into an inconsistency or an error and what can uh, arise as a particular characteristic and nature of the domain. And then you have additional concerns. You have interpretability, explainability, which is normally a very high concern for clinicians, of course. It is a high stakes domain because, because it, it's not only about saving money, it's about saving lives and some mistakes are very costly. Uh, privacy concerns, data availability, fairness, ethics, you name it. So it's, it's a huge, um, complicated uh, uh, domain to work on, but it's also the one where I believe that data centric AI will offer the most uh, possibilities in the next five to 10 years. So right now I want to do just a little disclaimer. I am specifically focused right now on structured and tabular data. And I'm, I'm, I will be speaking about data quality issues from a data scientist perspective. So if you want to check uh, other dimensions and God knows there are a lot of dimensions for data quality, you may check the Damon's research paper. They have, they have explored like 160 dimensions and come up with a final dimensions, uh, about 60 dimensions. Um, but these are not the ones I'm exploring here. So today I'm exploring four main types that I've encountered during my research on, on medical data, which are imbalanced data, overlap data, underrepresented data, and missing data. These are rather uh, frequent uh, problems occurring in healthcare domains, and often they arise in combination, which creates a, even a more complex problem. You have plenty of others. If I had the time, I would go over them, but let's just focus on which I think are the most interesting for also a beginner friendly perspective. So for the one hand, you have imbalanced data. So this refers to um, a disproportion in the, the concepts that you have in your data. And it is quite simple to explain. For instance, if you are talking um, about predicting breast cancer, you may have um, in a medical facility, decades of data and you have uh, most likely a larger number of records of healthy people than you have uh, with the disease. Um, and as you know, it's not just about, of course, the amount of data, but traditionally classifiers are biased for the concepts that are more well represented in your concepts. And may they may, for that reason, fail to classify those that are not so well represented why is this critical for medical data? Because normally the minority class is precisely those that is that is really important to detect. It's not just about rare cases, although those are even more critical. Um, right now, the ongoing research actually uh, is going towards the idea that imbalanced data 
per se is not a problem. For instance, if you look at the example that I just gave you, we could just take a, a linear classifier and, and do the gen it, it would get the job done for us. Um, it is, however, a context that will increase in a large scale the difficulty of these predictions when other factors are coming to play. So one of them is overlap data. So beyond you may or may not have class imbalance, class overlap is really critical. Um, how would this appear, for instance, in a healthcare domain? Imagine that you have patients in the early stage of a disease. Um, for most features, for most clinical values, they might be similar to healthy patients because the, the disease is not already developed yet. And as these patients, as these data points coexist in the same regions of the data space, it becomes very critical to define clear and simple decision boundaries to get our model straight. Same as before, ongoing research on this topic uh, is quite evolving on the idea that overlap itself will present different representations, different sources of complexity, either from feature value uh, overlap, which is rather simple to solve, but then you have other types such as multi-resolution or uh, different class queues uh, dispersed on the all over the, your data. You may have structural biases, so this is quite where we are going at right now. Um, another type of imbalance uh, is this what we call underrepresented data. It is uh, often uh, referred to as the small digest problem. So as standard classifiers are also learning by creating rules for well-represented concepts, which are larger digents, these types of little clusters in data, so they, these do belong to the same, for instance, in here, minority class, but they have different characteristics than uh, from, from each other. Okay, So this is even more complex when you are trying to learn a concept associated to a class. How this can be uh, represented on, your, on our previous example, imagine that you have clusters um, with different uh, characteristics as of young woman with a genetic background linked to breast cancer and you have older women with comorbidities. They both belong to the same concept, which is the disease group, but they do map onto very different characteristics. And they, if, if one of them um, it is less represented than the other, uh, then you have a small adjunct and it, it is very easy for a classifier to overfit precisely on those concepts. Um, particularly in this context where you may have class imbalance, class overlap, small digents and so on, it is very difficult to define what is the main concept, uh, what can be um, a rare scenario, but also valid at the same time, and what could be noise. So uh, spe specifically in the context of imbalance data, Defining noise or defining an outlier, it's not so simple to distinguish between both of these concepts. Um, and finally, you have missing data, which is also a very common factor uh, for uh, structural tabular uh, healthcare data. This may happen due to a lot of reasons. These are actually hard to identify. So missing data is generally three missing mechanisms. They can either be completely at random there's no obvious reason why that value is missing. It can be related to other features in the study which are observed, and it could be related directly to the feature that, to the value that would have been there if it had been collected. For instance, you are talking about completely random uh, situations where a patient just skips a question on the survey. You are talking about uh, at random, although this might be uh, misleading, uh, when you talk about there are missing values in a, a weight um, feature uh, for older women who are less likely to disclose uh, their weight, uh, or for obese, if you are talking about obese people that do not disclose their weight, then you would be talking about a missing mechanism that is definitely not random. So you know that this is directly related to the, the, the value that would have been there. Um, some classifiers can not even work with missing data. And generally all of them are compromised by, of course, the, the absence of information. 
Um, there's plenty of research going on uh, for missing data, especially with the new advent of deep learning techniques. We are exploring how can we diagnose these missing mechanisms? How can we impute with distributed data? Synthetic data, for instance, and also being mindful of why uh, and what for do we want to have the data complete? Do we want it to keep the general properties of data? This is normally a good standard, uh, but sometimes the best imputation mechanism or strategy is not necessarily the one that gets you the best performance. So this is kind of tricky. We're still figuring out um, how to get both, which would be uh, ideal. So this essentially um, uh, it creates like a very clear perspective on why data profiling is super important. Data profiling is essentially this idea of iteratively, continuously, systematically understanding your data, putting it out there, uh, checking with domain experts. Um, every time you get a model into production, uh, continuously understand what are the thresholds necessary uh, the requirements are always changing, the constraints are always changing, uh, and what you accept can also change in between. So it is a good uh, standard to uh, continuously verify this. Uh, I brought to you today this use case, this case study, which is actually the first one I've worked for. Uh, it was kind of typical because it had a lot of, of problems. It was a small data set, only 60, I believe 160 patients, uh, a high imbalance in terms of uh, classes. So you have, actually, I think you had uh, uh, more mortality, more, more patients who died and who lived. Um, and so, so nevertheless, it is uh, uh, the class imbalance in the outcome as well. Uh, although the minority in this case is not, um, necessarily the one that you are trying to predict. Uh, and then you have a lot of missing data from 50 features. Um, you have a huge percentage, I believe only eight records are absolutely complete. Uh, you had uh, what I call like concept heterogeneity because you do have patients with the same outcome that have different characteristics, but you, all, you also have patients with different characteristics that share the outcome. So uh, it, it is quite confusing uh, to determine which clusters uh, would map directly into, onto the same predictions. Um, and one way that we can use data profiling in this context where we don't know anything about data is to use some kind of tool uh, that uh, let us know uh, what exactly uh, are we, okay, okay, what exactly do we have to deal? One of them, uh, actually, this the state of the art right now. It has really as an open source. It is the top tier right now uh, for data profiling. Is pandas profiling? Um, I generated the report right here. Let me just tell you a little bit about it. Um, three good, great features. Uh, of pandas profiling is the automatic generation of alerts. So you can right away see what's going on with your data. Behind, uh, besides having your overview, uh, you can directly check what is wrong with a particular feature. You can support both tabular and time series data, and you can generate a comparison report. This has actually been a major feature request from the community uh, because sometimes you do a lot of data augmentation, synthetic data generation, uh, missing value imputation, and you want to compare different solutions of your data quality. Um, for instance, here for the HCC data set, of course, this is a simplified version, uh, but you can see right here the number of features that you have, numeric and categorical, automatically get an insight of what type of alerts you may have. For instance, a constant value on oxygen saturation, which probably means that it was hill coded or a simple sensor that uh, became faulty. Um, you have duplicate rows. This is not probably very, um, this is probably an inconsistency because with uh, hemoglobin, albumin and so on, it is very unlikely that two patients have the exact same values. So there's probably are values that you need to remove to drop these lines. Uh, you have an imbalance here at the encephalopathy degree, which means that these two cases might refer to underrepresented data. You might have to do some augmentation. 
uh, to be fair uh, with people on these two categories and also missing values on the parity in value, which you can then explore deeply on the correlations, iterations, and my personal favorite, okay, the missing values matrix, which you clearly get a very visual, very straightforward idea of your data. Um, so yeah, you can export this to a number of, of, um, of um, sorry, uh, formats. I just wasn't sure if you were looking at the same thing I was. Um, but yeah, this is basically the idea of, of pandas profiling. Finally, just give you a little taste of, uh, well, our community, not to be very uh, buggy with this. Um, we basically have a community that is uh, revolves around data. It's a space where we discuss this type of, of data quality issues, uh, the best practices on how to handle uh, data preparation pipelines. And we try to get a lot of contribution to open source software. If you want to get in touch and want to know more about us, you can just go to our Instagram, for instance, and then you have on the link uh, everything from our Discord server, Medium, and also the open sources if you want to check them out or contribute. Um, next Friday, we'll have uh, Ben Epstein, which is founder of Galileo, a co-host of MLOps, talking a little bit of data-centric AI if you don't know really what this is and the advantages may have. just hop in on our server and let's let's chat a little bit about it this is i think everything thank you so much for the opportunity uh yeah and i'll leave you with this this kathy o'neill which is a personal favorite writer of mine she's a really uh, fairness oriented uh, woman and uh, she's uh, also a very skeptic person as well and this uh, data centric branding i think goes a lot into it thinking about data, thinking about uh, what it means, uh, what, how we, we can really understand it and put the science into data science. Thank you so much. So I'm just checking if uh, there's any questions. If you want to post them, feel free. Kathy O'Neill is a great writer, for sure, and a great speaker as well. Our TED Talks are incredible. Uh, yeah, you can join uh, Friday's event. Uh, just go to our Instagram and check the Discord link. Everything will, will be uh, posted on there. Uh, thank you so much for your support. You can, of course, Keep in touch. I'm, I think, everywhere if you want uh, any, any type of uh, additional information, just let me know. Questions, follow ups, you're, you're welcome anytime. Okay. Uh, about why the synthetic data platform? Well, I cannot disclose too much. Um, but yeah, you can go to uh, our uh, website and just get to try now because we are launching this uh, this free um, free features available to everyone. You can check it is in a very synthetic way. Um, it's just a way to generate um, new data, which releases your issues with privacy, mimics your data in a way that it keeps the important relationships of data, um, the data distribution and so on, um, being a little bit of a clone of your data. So it's not your, your original data, of course, that's the point, but it keeps all the structure that you need to build your, mo your models with confidence, basically, that's it. I think you can access the platform by going here. Let me just just yeah, you can check the free trial here. And it will actually help us a lot to know what type of things we need to improve. And you'll get the credentials right away to test the fabric. If you want to, I'm sorry, let me give you just 
as well our GitHub. Because you do have um, profiling. Not only the, the pandas profile, but you can also check the why did the if you have all the documentation you need there. Okay. And you can start building your models with the guns uh, we have left in there. So just open it on a collab notebook, upload some of our examples and start, start exploring um, the solutions. a link to the community if you want to check updates as well. Yeah, exactly. Review especially. One for pandas. Oh, I was okay. I was not sorry. <laughs> I was not posting to everyone. Yeah, so this one right here has all of your what you were looking for. Let's try now again. Let me check. Oh, it's so tricky. I can't want to see as well. Okay. Okay, resources for learning and ensuring data quality. Yeah, sure. I can talk about a few of my favorites. Well, I'm biased, of course. Um, but we do have on our on our organization um an awesome data centric uh, repo let me just share it here it has a collection of data profiling as well as data synthetic tools that you can explore and use uh, i also have a particularly favorite one which is more like on data um, data complexity um it's called i think pi mfe yeah this is also like a meta feature extraction it is really helpful if you need to know how complex your data is and sometimes quality is more or less linked to complexity because as i've said it's not all about inconsistencies sometimes it is uh, it had arise, some issues arise naturally from the from the nature of the of your domain, and in this particular case, you will need to define okay, how complex is my data? What can I do uh, about it? And this actually creates um, a very comprehensive list of complexity measures, which may give you a flavor of what type of things are you looking for, and when you are working with large amounts of data. Uh, pointing to what you should be looking for is also um, a lot of time saved and money saved. If you want to follow up or connect with me, please feel free. Um, and I can follow up everything there. Just send me a message and we'll connect. I guess that's it. Um, Andrew yeah. had, a, had a question. Uh, the medical data aggregation and analysis process appears unstructured. Are there any standards or certified data aggregation and quality assurance protocols which are applied to medical data? Yeah, actually, I'm not um, the best person to answer this question. As I've said, my experience has been mainly with structured data. On unstructured, we have just worked on uh, medical imaging, uh, and this is often quite curated from the medical teams we have been working with. So the main problems here was were annotation, uh, perhaps some movements that the patient did that made the images a little blurry, uh, missing data with some kind of, of noise. 
but unfortunately I can look for, but I don't have any ideas specifically on this type of protocols, but it is an interesting question. The link to the demo paper just saw that right here. Destinations quality. Here, okay. I do believe they have another one on how to select the right dimensions. This is a scope. Yeah. I don't know, you can you want to take it from here? Sure. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it seems like we are. <clears throat> One sec. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm coughing a little bit. No problem. Okay. It seems like uh, we are out of questions for now. So uh, thank you very much for that presentation, Miriam. That was great. Very insightful. Mm -hmm. uh, love to learn a little bit about the importance of data quality and how it relates to healthcare and what why data is doing in this space. Um, really appreciate you coming on and talking about this, and I'm really excited for Why Data's uh, presentations and conferences next Friday. Um, so uh, I am the last speaker, um, and I've got quite a bit of time. I will not speak for an hour and 15 minutes, um, but I will uh, start my presentation now. Let me figure out how to share my screen as well. Um, share. Okay. So I am... Let's see, my screen sharing, my screen sharing is paused. Okay, let me figure out this out because I'm I'm from full screen. So I think you guys should be able to see this. Uh how do I okay? If there's any, ah, here's a chat. We can see it. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Um, so I'm going to be talking about the applications of uh and, oh, let me close the chat so I can see my screen. I'm going to be talking about the applications of uh, NLP on text data. Um, I'm actually going to be talking about applications of NLP in general. This is going to be a very, uh, this is going to be a rather like uh, technical talk. Um, we're going to go over some high level explorations of neural networks, and we're going to be going over some applications as well. Um, I'm not going to be talking as much about the AI infrastructure side of things, as we've just heard from two great speakers, uh, Ayush and Miriam, about the side of uh, AI infrastructure and how these kinds of tools can be used to create AI tools and AI products. Um, my experience is mostly in the application of AI's tools. Uh, so I started out, um, well, actually, no, my I, I did start out in uh, AI infrastructure my first full-time professional role was creating AutoML at Amazon, where I uh, helped create the AutoML lifecycle system. And for you guys that are unfamiliar with it, uh, AutoML is basically the uh, entire lifecycle of the machine learning um, model that is managed by a computer, by a machine. Um, and it's basically all of the ML, ML ops stuff put together. So from, for example, you start with your training data, which we saw, uh, I used to talk about the RoboFlow stuff, right? Uh, you take your training data, you start with that, you train your model, and then you can also host your model somewhere, you deploy your model, you have to query your model, uh, you know, get inference. And then over time, um, and we'll hear more about like model observability tomorrow and data stuff tomorrow as well. Uh, but there's also this thing called drift detection, where you have to detect how your model changes over time. And this is extremely important when it comes to uh, data that changes quickly. Um, especially things like perhaps uh, climate change or um, differences as people, uh, you know, uh, as, as we get more and more data in healthcare, we'll also see different changes. Uh, for example, COVID was rapidly changing. If you had trained a model for COVID at the beginning, it would have rapidly changed over time. So that's, um, that's kind of where I started doing this auto ML applications of uh, AI infrastructure kind of stuff. And then I moved into natural language processing with experience with uh, assembly AI and DeepGram where I worked with the um, speech to text area of things. And then I did some, and I created a text 
uh, API, text processing API that you guys will hear about later. Um, so yeah, that's kind of a little bit about me and my introduction. Um, I have just always been into AI because I'm a nerd and I just like it. This has just been what I think is the zeitgeist. I think it's going to be very popular in the next 10, in the next, uh, very popular and very important in the next 10, 20 years. We're going to be really looking at a lot of things in AI, Web3, VR, uh, and renewable energies. And these are kind of my areas of interest. Um, and so in this one, we're going to be talking about AI and spe 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 uh, specifically NLP. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, how do I? Ah, okay, I clicked. Okay. So the overview of this specific presentation is going to be about um, what is natural language processing. We're going to take a look at what natural language processing is. Uh, and then we're going to take a dive into some neural network architectures. And some of these will be, um, we're going to go from the basic neural networks all the way into some specific uh, natural language processing neural networks. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about historical applications of NLP. I might have forgotten the slide on this. Uh, modern day applications of NLP and NLP for text data, and then some business applications of NLP on text data, like some uh, real world examples of things that, uh, uh, that use text data. So let's get started. So what is natural language? So the first thing about natural language processing you probably have to understand is what is natural language? There's two types of languages that we split things into. So we have natural languages and formal languages. Um, so natural languages are like English, like what I'm speaking right now. Uh, or if you guys speak other languages, um, Portuguese, Spanish, Chinese, um, German, you know, all of these languages that we speak with each other are considered natural languages. And that's because they're formed naturally over time as a way to communicate things in the real world. And natural language often natural languages often don't have a or well, they never have a specific set of rules and they're often it's often hard to describe the actual rules. So if you learned English or if you learned a language in school, you probably experienced this where you were like learning like all these different things and you're like learning about verbs and regular verbs and irregular verbs and you're like why are there more irregular verbs than regular verbs? I don't know. Um, but natural languages are dis are distinctly difficult to deal with for machines because there's no set of rules that tell you exactly how you should deal with the language. Formal languages, on the other hand, are things where there are a specific set of rules that tell you how to deal with the language. And since you guys are at an Applications of AI and AI Infrastructure Summit, I would assume that you have some, ex uh, some experience with formal languages the most formal languages that we see are programming languages, C, Java, Python, JavaScript. All of these are examples of formal languages. Um, so as part of NLP, there are, there are multiple parts of NLP, right? So there's natural language processing, which is kind of like an overall overarching kind of thing. And then there's natural language understanding, which is part of natural language processing. Um, and, it's, and that is when you have <clears throat> the machine uh, understand the natural language. So if, for example, if I were to say, uh, oh, so here we go, Alexa, for example, or uh, Google Google Home is kind of a good example of this. Um, if I'm like, Alexa, please turn on the lights. Alexa needs to understand that uh, what turn on means and what lights are, or maybe a better example is be kitchen lights. You don't want to turn on all the lights in your house at once. Um, maybe you do, but... Uh, for example, if I had said, if I say, Alexa, please turn on the kitchen lights, Alexa has to understand um, what turn on the lights means and what the kitchen lights and where the kitchen lights are. Um, so that's an example of natural language understanding. And then we also have natural language generation, which is another part of NLP. And this is something that is huge recently. I'm sure that you guys have seen chat GPT or GPT-3, you know, all of that kind of stuff. Um, actually, oh, I'll, let me go back to natural language understanding. Dolly or Dolly 2, which was released earlier last year, right before, a little bit before chat GPT, you know, the image generation stuff. That model also has to have some level of natural language understanding. It has to understand what you mean when you say something like, when you tell it something like, make me a painting of the Mona Lisa in the style of Starry Night. Um, it has to understand, you know, what is the Mona Lisa and what is the style of Starry Night? 
Um, now there's also image processing and image generation that goes into that that is is more uh, you know on the computer vision side of things, and we're not going to talk about that here, but that's part of natural language understanding as well. But like I said, ChatGPT three is something that's big, big in natural language generation recently. Everybody has been pretty much using this, and we've all seen kind of both of the advantages, the disadvantages of uh, ChatGPT recently. So you know the advantages are really cool. You can have it generate things like. Uh, but you can basically have it generate anything. You can have it generate a story. Um, I didn't use it for this, but I probably could have had it generate an entire paragraph or an entire write-up on what is natural language processing, right? Um, <clears throat> but the disadvantages of that is that ChatGPT3, ChatGPT uh, Chat doesn't actually understand, doesn't have like an understanding of like what language really means. Okay, my throat is... <clears throat> the way that these language models work, and you'll kind of see this later, I don't talk about large language models in this presentation, but you'll see this later as we talk about the neural networks. <clears throat> the, um, the neural networks process words as numbers. Oh, geez. <clears throat> so when it generates things, it generates words that it has seen together before, based on math, not on, for example, um, you and your friends will talk about things like what's going on in your life, maybe like, uh, uh, oh, I'm, I'm making banana pudding later today, um, or like yesterday I made steak, or uh, I went running this weekend, or something like that. Um, chat chat GPT or natural language generation models, I keep using chat GPT as an example just because it's so easy and it's so relevant. Um, Natural language generation models can't really do that kind of stuff. Instead, it can take things that has seen together before, and it can put that together to create uh, an imitation of natural language. OK, so now this is the introduction to natural language processing. This is basically what uh, natural language is. There's many areas of it. There's text, there's speech to text, there's text to speech, and so on. Um, before, uh, so now before we get into the actual applications, I'm going to run through some neural network architectures. Um, you guys probably have like some idea of these things already. Um, so a lot of this is going to be just review, but I'm just going to kind of go into what neural networks are so we can understand what we talk about, what we're talking about when we talk about how natural language is applied and um, why the application of the natural language is uh, useful or important. Um, so <clears throat> the first thing I'm going to talk about here is just an introduction to neural networks. This is a picture of a fully connected neural network. This is the simplest neural network, and it's not the simplest neural network. You can really have one node that goes, or two, one input node and one uh, output node, or two input nodes and one output node, and that's like a perceptron, which is the base <clears throat> neural network model. Oh, I really should drink more water. <clears throat> <clears throat> but this one is a deep neural network. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to mute myself while I cough. How do I do that? Okay, I apologize that um, I'm a little coffee today. Um, so neural networks, uh, this is a deep neural network. And basically what that means is that there's a hidden layer, which you can see right here. And a hidden layer is a representation of the, uh, imp of, of the, of the representation that lies between the input and the output state. Um, and this will become more uh, important as we talk about encoder decoder models. But basically, you know, an input layer, feed, you feed some numbers, some math, and then the neural network does some calculations here using weights and biases. Uh, and it turns it into a hidden layer, which represents the input slightly differently. You transforms the input so that you can uh, retransform it later into an output layer. So this is two um, outputs. So this is probably like a yes and a no. You can also do a yes and no with a one output, which is just a yes model. But basically what this would take is you have three different inputs and you would get into two outputs. So maybe, uh, this is, this would present an example of something like, um, let's see, what takes three different inputs? Maybe you have like a flower, uh, the, 
the size of the flower, um, the height of the length of the stem, and the uh, amount of water that you have. And this will tell you, will the flower live a week? Something like that, right? So this is the example of a fully uh, connected neural network. Now let's look into the neural networks that are specifically used for natural language processing. Hmm? What's going on? Ah, OK. RNNs are the most basic form of the natural language processing um, type of models. Yes, you can use linearly fully connected neural networks for natural language processing, but these are the base ones that most uh, NLP models were built off of. Um, so this example here kind of shows you what makes something uh, RNN. It's the recurrence. Um, and if you have been programming for a while, you are somewhat familiar with recursion and you are probably like, oh God, that is so annoying. I remember when I was learning about recursion, everybody was like, this is the most annoying concept. Recursion is actually a great, great concept. It's really cool. Basically you reuse the same functionality on different inputs. And that's exactly what the recurrent neural network does. Um, and there's two basic types of, so here, this is one, um, layer and this is the input this is the output so let's look back on this for example so in a in a recurrent neural network this would have a circle here so you would take the hidden layer input and you would reuse it in order to uh, understand the state and more information about the current processes about like uh, for example if you have a sentence you're going to have to understand some context uh, there's going to be multiple tokens in that sentence and rnns kind of allow you to reuse some of the information from prior uh, inputs um so when you unfold this you kind of get this thing where you have h and t t is your time step which represents your prior inputs so in this example of a recurrent neural network we're using some prior inputs and we're just looping it back. And this is the you know prior input from before. This is the this is the hidden state from before, and then O is the output. This was uh, come up with I think it was the 1980s, might have been the early 1990s. I don't completely remember. Um, but this is basically what uh, the first kind of examples that were able to have better accuracy on processing natural language. Now we're going to come to the group, which actually is out of place. I should talk about the LSTM first. Um, but these are two models that are, this is the H. So we're, so, you know, from here to here, from this one to this one, we started looking at the hidden layer as the H. And now we're going to go into that H. We're going to go into the nodes in that hidden layer. This is a group. This is a gated recurrent unit. And in a gated recurrent unit, what's happening is you're basically uh, getting rid of, or you're, you're, mm, you're using some uh, process inside of the node to um, determine whether or not the recurrence is uh, necessary in a sense. Um, and <clears throat> I'm actually gonna talk about these kind of in parallel because they are almost the same thing. Uh, an LSTM is long short-term memory. And basically this lets you keep more things in memory and decide when to forget them. And it has a forget gate. Uh, a gated recurrent unit is a LSTM that doesn't have a forget gate. Um, and the basic uh, example, uh, the basic difference here is uh, in the, the performance of these types of, uh, uh, node architectures, architectures, yes, that's the right word, uh, is almost the same. It's very, very similar. Uh, gated recurrence units have been shown to have a better performance on certain smaller data sets with um, kind of like weird distributions. And LSTMs, uh, but on, on like, like on the LSTMs and groups kind of perform the same at a large scale. Um, we're not going to go into the exact, you know, structure here, but basically um, the what you want to know about this is like kind of like what's the input, right? Um, and LSTMs and um, gated recurrence units have <clears throat> the forget gate, uh, the hit. Oh, what did I just do? The hidden state um, and the prior input. So that's basically all you need to know. Oh, wait, sorry, there's one more. Um, that's basically all you need to know about the deep state of the the kind of like inside workings. Now we're going to go look at an architecture style thing. Encoder, decoder, transformation models. These things are the 
all the rage recently. This was the late 2010s that this stuff was invented or uh, first written about, basically. And this is um, this is like a, a specific kind of architecture for recurrent neural networks. And actually, you don't need an RNN in encoder decoder models. Um, but you typically do have, you typically still use an RNN in these models. And then you add a fully connected layer, which is what this is on top of that. Um, the main thing that you should know about this stuff, the encoder decoder models, is that you take an input, you put it into an encoder, and then you get a hidden state and you put it into a decoder. Now, how is this different than just using a deep neural network, right? So in a deep neural network, uh, you continuously pass, uh, you do a forward pass and you continue, oh, what am I, what's going on here? You continuously pass information through the network. In an encoder decoder model, when before the information goes from the encoder to the decoder, it is written into a vector. So basically you're flattening out some information and that vector contains all of the context that you need. And this is basically how attention models have come to be. You guys have probably heard about attention models a little bit. Attention models are, uh, there was this really famous paper called Attention is All You Need. I think it came out of, I don't want to say uh, Google or Facebook, but it came out of one of the big tech companies. I don't know which one. Um, and it basically tells you about uh, attention and how you can apply attention to different uh, large corpuses of text. And this model came out. It was all the rage. It did really, really well. And um, it used this kind of encoder decoder state. Now, typically, uh, encoder decoder states now do this. They, they, this additional input thing is how you use the attention. And that actually allows you to pass more than one hidden state along so that you can have more context. Uh, so I'll, I'm going to give an example. I, I have a bunch of like blogs and um, articles about this that I'll drop in the chat later that you can go look at uh, that'll give, go more in depth into these things. Um, but I, I'll just give an example of um, uh, of what a hidden state could be. Like, let's say and this is, um, oh, right, right. Because encoder decoders were really important for uh, translation. Um, so, you know, if you speak multiple languages, this is kind of like why it's important. Encoder decoders have this advantage of uh, being able to input and output a different length sequences. Uh, so typically your LSTMs do same length sequences. So you're gonna have to do padding and stuff. So encoder decoders allow you to input, output diff different sequences. Um, they also are really helpful with image captioning, right? You put in one image, one sequence, or like, you know, uh, images are actually represented as sequences of the pixels. And then you get one, like, you know, 10 word output or something like that. Um, now let's go into applications of natural language processing. So there's a few like, you know, main applications. There's text analysis. Um, and then I created the text API that does text analysis. Uh, there's speech to text, um, deep speech, deep gram, assembly AI, uh, wit, houndify. There's a ton of speech to text companies out there. Um, and then they uh, mostly use seek to seek type models, sequence to sequence type models. Uh, this came out of Facebook. I do know where this uh, original research paper came out of. Um, Text-to-speech is something that's been kind of like, you know, people have been working on this for a long time, and it's usually pretty bad. Um, Microsoft recently released Volley, Valley. I don't know, Valley, Volley, I don't know. It's it's not like Dolly. It's like Dolly, but with a V. Um, and this is supposed to be a good, like, text-to-speech model that uh, produces near natural language kind of like uh, speech. And there's conversational AI, chatbots. You guys have seen these. If you go on many, many websites, um, pretty much like any e-commerce website you're going to go on is probably has a chat a chat bot. Um, a lot of startups, SaaS APIs have these chat bots. And um, this is, these are the main kind of areas of applications of NLP. Uh, and before we go on to the next slide, I'm also going to talk a little bit about like the historical applications. Um, so, you know, Translation is something that was kind of big. And originally, NLP kind of came out of this idea that we wanted to translate English and Russian, or at least in America. Um, and then it came out and people started using conversational AI. If you guys have heard of Eliza, that's one of the original NLP applications. Eliza was this chatbot that 
uh, was similar to a uh, therapist, but really what it was doing was it was doing the, uh, it was, it was rules-based. It was still rules-based. And like we talked about before, natural language processing doesn't have rules uh, that you can actually use to describe the entire, natural languages don't have rules that you can actually use to describe how the language works. Um, and, you know, over time, people have used uh, natural language processing a lot for translation and for chatbots. And now we're getting into really this speech to text kind of uh, text analysis area. Um, originally, speech to text was pioneered, uh, or I don't want to say pioneered, but one of the first big present, uh, first big business applications of speech to text was Nuance Dragon for healthcare, which is a transcription technology for healthcare. And it came out and it was like 60% accurate. And they were like, and people were still like raving over it because they were like, this is way easier than having like, you know, the doctor or the nurse write down everything, especially because, you know, handwriting deteriorates uh, as you write down more things. Um, so these are the big applications of NLP. Now let's go on and we're going to talk about NLP on text data, which is what this presentation is supposed to be about. And I have spent a lot of time talking about just the primers of NLP in general. So um, there's obviously there's more areas of application than this. There's NLP on text data is actually a pretty budding field. There are so many things that you can do with it. And these are just some areas where it already exists. Um, I'm sure that you know you guys here can think about where you might want to do with what you might want to do with this and come up with more areas that you could apply text data. So the main four areas of application that I'm going to be talking about in the in the next few minutes in the next few slides are finance, healthcare, automation, and reputation management. Um, so a uh, finance, obviously, you know, um, fintech is a big space. If you're in startups, there's a ton of fintech startups and a ton of them apply AI, a ton of them apply uh, machine learning tools. Um, and finance has a lot of text. If you work in private equity, public equity, or, sorry, private equity or in public markets, there, there's just so many texts, so much text. Healthcare, like I said earlier, um, Healthcare was really one of the pioneering fields, one of the biggest fields that NLP kind of started in for business through uh, uh, transcription. Um, automation, there's a lot of things you can automate using NLP. And reputation, um, which is mainly things like, this is kind of like, a, you can look at social media, you can look at uh, news outlets and things like that. Um, and the main challenges that we're currently facing, and this is hopefully something that you guys can think about and maybe you can solve some of these problems, um, the main challenges in NLP for text data and in general that we're seeing today are uh, context. So um, there is like uh, a lot of text doesn't come with all of the context attached to it. And you probably have this experience in, in your life as well. Um, there's just a lot. It's like you're texting your friends, right? You know, you need you have a lot of context to understand what the text means. And natural language processing needs to, and, you know, machines just don't have all of the context that we have as humans. Um, so it's context is one of the challenges. Um, processing, and so this is like, I mean, this is more concerned with the amounts of data and like putting them together. So actually machines can process data quicker, more data together than we probably can individually, like in terms of like reading versus like just like throwing text at a machine. Um, but this is still one of the challenges that uh, we deal with and processing data correctly, uh, the right data, right? Um, tone of voice. Uh, so something that we um, talk about a lot is like tone of voice. And, and if you look at uh, research around communication, human communication, most of human communication is actually done through tone of voice and body language. And so a lot of what you talk about, people actually forget. And this is why I repeat a lot of the same things. Um, a lot of what you talk about, people forget. And so tone of voice is actually really important. But in text data, you don't have as much tone of voice, or it's harder to discern tone of voice without context. And finally, uh, one of the biggest challenges, and I'm sure there are more challenges than this, but finally, one of the biggest challenges that I want to talk about here is domain specificity. And this is especially important in finance and healthcare. Um, this is also important in reputation because um, reputation honestly looks at a lot of things like social media and social media has a lot of slang on it that you're going to have to understand. And that's domain specific to internet slang. Um, but other domain spe specific applications, you know, like finance and healthcare, for example, um, in healthcare, there's going to be a lot of medical terms that 
probably don't come up anywhere else. Like, like strep throat. I, I don't even know what the full word for that is, but it's a long, it's a long word. Um, and in finance, you're going to have lots of things like, uh, I don't, I don't know that much about finance, POS, point of sale, or you're going to be talking about uh, YOY, like year over year, um, ROI, uh, and some terms that don't often come up in your regular uh, speech. Um, someone says BSA. I, I don't know what that means, actually. Uh, okay, so let's take a look at some applications of NLP in finance. So one of the, it's for the biggest applications in finance, ah, Bank Secrecy Act. Ah, great. Yeah, thank you, Jim. I didn't know what that was. Um, so risk assessment, for example. So risk assessment is something that you can do by actually, this is something that junior finance analysts go and do. They read a ton of documents and they assess the risk on different investments or uh, different, you know, accounts and things like that. Um, and generally this takes a long time and it takes people a long time to do this. Uh, and JP Morgan recently released a report in 2021, maybe 2020, sometime in the last few years where they automated 360,000 hours of risk assessment type work in 15 minutes. And that is a huge time saver. And that's why this kind of like, you know, AI technology is so important. Um, and then there's accounting and auditing. So you can do a lot of, uh, a lot of accounting and auditing is, you know, reading, reading papers, basically. You just have to like read these like uh, reports and make sure that the accounting is done correctly. Make sure that there's uh, no, you know, uh, nothing written incorrectly, nothing, uh, that doesn't add up and stuff like that. And, you know, auditing is the same thing. Auditing and accounting are, are, you know, somewhat similar auditing and account, you know. Um, and there's portfolio optimization. And this is somewhat similar to risk assessment, right? Um, but this is like, you know, you're going to do something where you want to uh, create an investment portfolio. Um, and you want to optimize your portfolio, right? Like you want to get the best return out of your portfolio. There are many ways to do this. There's technical analysis, there's functional analysis, or I think it's called functional analysis, uh, formal analysis maybe, but you can read a ton of different papers similar to the risk assessment thing. But usually this is uh, also, I mean, this is also done in big banks, but you can also do this yourself. Um, and you can go and spend a lot of time reading things or you can pass things and you can pass text through some sort of text analysis platform. And then there's financial document analysis, which is really the same thing, but there's many, many financial documents and not all of them are related to risk. Some of these are just reports of uh, like, you know, like the yearly reports, your 10Ks, your 10Qs, your quarterly reports. Um, and in private sector, this is a bit different. Um, I didn't write about this in here, but in private equity, uh, you probably also want to do entity resolution. Um, and actually, I'll talk about that in automation. Um, but in entity resolution is this thing where you want to make sure that in private uh, reports, many people use different words that mean the same thing. And you want to be able to put all of those together under one umbrella about a company, right? And so there's a lot of different things that you can do with natural language text processing in this space. Uh, now let's move, move on to healthcare. So healthcare, like I said, is another huge area of um, using text and natural language processing. There's computer-assisted coding, which is basically, you know, using NLP and text to make sure that your codes are all correct that you're putting into the, the database, right? Uh, there's clinical documentation and clinical assertion. So these two are somewhat linked, somewhat similar. Um, in when you are diagnosing things, or if you're a doctor diagnosing things, uh, you want to make sure that your documentation is correct uh, and that you are um, reading the right uh, history of your patient. You want to make sure you want to check things if they are persistent over time or if a certain treatment has helped your patients more than another's um, or how your patients are reacting uh, to certain certain treatments and medications and things like that. And both the documentation and the assertion are important in that um, area. I believe that computer assisted coding is the use case for many industries. Yes, uh, I think you're talking about like the Copilot, ChatGPT stuff. Um, and that 
is like like you know or or like like you know uh, automatic recommendation. Um, yes, that is not what I'm talking about in healthcare. So coding in healthcare is slightly different than coding in programming, which we as you know technical professionals probably think of coding as an I'm going to go write some Python, some Java, some C plus plus, whatever. Uh, and that's that's not what I mean in this case. Uh, healthcare has coding that is like coding for uh, specific uh, diseases, prognoses, or treatments. Um, and there's trial matching. Trial matching, um, if you guys are familiar with this, is basically when you have a lot of uh, healthcare, they do a lot of trials, like drug trials, medications, stuff like that. And you want to be able to match people to the right trials, and you kind of have a profile of somebody. And um, yes, thank you, Jim. Coding is using a code to equal an illness, malady, or treatment. Uh, trial matching is when you match um, multiple, uh, when you match profiles to a description of a trial. And so, you know, obviously people do this, uh, you can do this in a rule-based manner. You can do this using people, um, but you can also just throw text at NLP and it'll do this um, and, and as some sort of natural language processing model and it'll do this for you as well. Sorry. Um, okay. NLP is also used in automation. Uh, this was something that I actually discovered through the use of, through the creation of the text API. People have come to me for this. Um, you can use it in supply chain documentation. Uh, this is an interesting use case. Basically, in supply chains, you have to document what's being sent around. Um, and you can have people do that. In most cases, they do have people do that, but they also outsource this to some companies that'll create software to do this. And you can use NLP to do this actually, because it will uh, process what's been going, what's, what's come in and what goes out. And it'll also write the documentation for you, or it'll help you sort out what you need to put into the documentation. Um, and there's insight discovery. So for example, if you are, uh, if you if you want to look at a document and understand, let's say you're doing market research, um, what you want to know about the market can be found through insight and entity discovery. So there's this very popular use case. This is one of the most popular um, pieces on my blog for a while. It's called uh, Named Entity Recognition or NER. And this is basically a way for people to uh, use to send a document to a natural language processing model and it'll spit out the entities in there. And you can also have it spit out maybe the most common entities. Uh, and entities are things like locations, organizations, people, dates, amounts of money, and things like that. And when you have something that can do the entity recognition and the entity linking for you, you can automatically get insights into the document and what it's talking about and um, what you could be learning from it. And then finally, sentiment analysis is also super common. I'm sure you guys have heard of sentiment analysis. Uh, this is like a big thing in, well, I mean, like finance, healthcare, everything basically, you know, like in healthcare, you can use sentiment analysis to look at, um, you know, how are your patients feeling? In finance, you can use sentiment analysis to do things like, how are people feeling about the market? Um, and yeah, so these are the main use cases of NLP and automation. And finally, we'll look take a look at NLP and reputation management. And the reason why I found out about this was because I worked with a company that did this. Um, so basically, it's mostly sentiment and instantly linking. So it's similar to NLP and automation. Um, what you want to do is you basically, it's a little bit different because you're instead of like applying it to specific things, what you also need in, in reputation management is you need to automate stuff. Uh, so in NLP and reputation management, you can use can news outlet sentiment. For example, you can look at the New York Times, uh, Associated Press, uh, MSNBC, BBC, CNN, all of these different uh, news outlets. And you can go read about the sentiment of your company. You can read about how often your company is mentioned. Um, and you can read about what other companies are mentioned with your company, what people, and many things like that. And um, I have a piece, I have multiple pieces about how to use the New York Times with this, and I can, I can link those later as well. Uh, and then social media sentiment is a big one. So this is something that is primarily uh, affecting uh, social media influencers. So for example, if you are uh, an Instagram model, um, 
or a food Instagrammer, or if you are a company with a Instagram or a Twitter or a LinkedIn, you can go and monitor what people are saying about you on social media to understand public sentiment. So for example, if Kanye West had this in um, you know late 2022, he probably would have chilled out. Um, other like examples of this is like linking mentions. And this would be uh, like if you had multiple things that uh, you could link the way that people mention you. Who mentions you? Uh, when do they mention you? Who mentions you from other people's mentions? So for example, like let's say um, you are on social media and you mention me and this talk on social media, then I could go and I could say, hey, look, I could see and I could see like, oh, like, you know, somebody from uh, the a applications of AI and AI infrastructure talk, that would be the first link, mention me. And this is what they said about it. They said, oh, this was, talk was great, or oh, this talk was terrible, or you know, something like that. And so this is kind of like how you can use this kind of text data and reputation management. Um, now let's talk about some real world examples. Uh, so like I've talked about earlier, um, Twitter scraping for reputation. Uh, can you talk about NLP scrum management? Um, I can talk about this in a second. Let me finish this real world examples and I'll talk about this at the end, Chris. Uh, so real world examples, uh, Twitter scraping for reputation, like I was saying, you can go and scrape Twitter and get a continuous feed of what the sentiment on Twitter is, what people are mentioning you with, um, who who's mentioning you, uh, why they're mentioning you, um, what dates they're mentioning you with, where are they mentioning you, and all of these different things. You can go and scrape Twitter and you can check your reputation in different geographical locations at different times of day and things like that. Um, sports betting. So this is something that I personally did actually. Uh, in 2021, I decided to just, just check this out uh, and I bet some money on football games. Um, and I went on Twitter and I just scraped what Twitter sentiment was and kind of like bet uh, on games based on Twitter sentiment. Interestingly enough, I found that lower Twitter sentiment before games actually correlated strongly, more strongly with the team with the lower sentiment winning. Don't know what that says, but I feel like it just tells us that humans are not very good at predicting things. Um, content moderation. I wrote a piece on this. You can use content moderation with your uh, natural language processing. So for example, uh, maybe you are uh, triggered by guns or um, something like that. You know, There's a bunch of triggers that people have. You can go and have some system that moderates the content and make sure that uh, none of that comes up for you. Or if you have kids and you want to make sure that uh, you know there's no gore or sexual content or whatever for them, you can have content moderation for that as well. Um, and then finally, there's automatic entity sorting. And this is related, oops, this is related mostly to the supply chain documentation, which is interesting, um, is you can have uh, often documents uh, require things to be in specific formats. And the automating entity sorting will sort those entities into those formats for you. Uh, so maybe you need to have the name before the organization or the organization before the name. You can pull that out and you can have that automatically done using natural language processing. So this is basically all that I have for the uses of natural language processing. I hope that this is giving you some inspiration and giving you some thoughts. And uh, maybe you can think about what you're going to build. Um, and my last question to you guys is, what will you build? If you have other questions or con comments, you can email me. You can connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, I can drop those in the chat. And let me go answer this last question. Can you talk about NLP Scrum Management? I work in Agile and I often think NLP implementations takes a long time. Time and resource intensive for NLP, unless things have changed in the last six months, need to keep the team engaged for a long cycle. Mm, I probably need more information to answer this. If you want to tell me a bit about like what you mean by NLP implementations take a long time. Like for example, if you want to implement text analysis, you just go and you go like sign up for an account on the text API and you can get NUR, you can get summarization, you can get, um, you know, uh, sentiment analysis, all that stuff in just one API call. Like that's, it shouldn't, like, you can get started in, like, a minute. Um, if you need, like, specific uh, specific um, domain-specific stuff, 
then you probably want to like fine tune some models and then you probably need like a research team or you need at least one ML engineer. Um, for me specifically, I have never seen, uh, I've never seen thing, NLP implementations take that long. Um, that is uh, pretty unfortunate. Most of my projects, like when I was in Amazon were, six months is, is, is a decently long project, uh, it, it, unless you're building like a huge product. Um, yeah. So that's it for my slides. Uh, if you guys want to comment below, I would love to hear more about what you'll build and what uh, this has inspired you to do. Um, looking forward to the links provided. Yes, I will drop the links. Uh, can I say something about how NLP advancements may influence ed tech or uh, mobile language learning? Um, how NLP will influence ed tech? Sure. I mean, like ed tech is, is I think, is in a pretty uh, budding field as well. It's not super saturated. Um, it's quite uh, new. There's a lot of new um, applications pop popping up. And NLP can help through things like you can analyze whether or not, uh, you can analyze like, um, let's say you have a text uh, and you want to do a reading problem for some, for students. Uh, you can have your NLP model kind of understand the text and create some question answers that you can then give to your students. And this is less work for you so that you don't have to do as much coming up with questions and answers like that. Um, you can use NLP to process essay grades. Um, so for example, if you want your students to write an essay on the importance of machine learning and the applications of AI, then you can use a natural language processing. You can run that through one of your natural language processing models and you can learn about what people are writing about and um, what they're talking about in that manner. Uh, mobile language learning, uh, you mean like uh, like learning different languages on a phone. Um, if that's what you mean, like, yeah, I mean, there are new NLP technologies and models that are coming up that are meant to run on phones. So one of the problem, one of the challenges with NLP is that it does take a lot of processing power. And that is one thing that we can work together to fix. Um, sure. Okay, uh, Chris, how do you do sentiment analysis on emojis? So this one is probably a, a domain specific one. You're gonna have to basically um, encode the emoji into a uh, rule or into uh, or feed a model a ton of emojis and give it like what they're supposed to mean. Um, yeah, yeah. Emojis are uh, encoded as emojis are encoded as like like differently than like regular words, right? Because emojis are encoded as one word. So, for example, if you're on Discord, or sometimes they're encoded as one string. Sorry, uh, no spaces usually. So, if you're on Discord and you want to type in like a thumbs up, you do colon plus one colon, which uh, doesn't look anything like regular like text. It doesn't look anything like I scrape Twitter. Um, and so you need like a specific, you need to train this, a model specifically for this. And this is uh, something that you might also just want to implement rules around it. You might just want to say, hey, a plus one, a, a thumbs up, a plus one, that is like a 0.5 uh, positive sentiment, you know? Um, so there's, there's other things you can do for this. Um, let me link the, let me drop the links. Uh, NLP. Ah, so here are some links to NLP in general. Um, and I'll talk about the Keras ones, the, uh, sorry, the um, GRU and the uh, recurrent neural networks uh, the and the long short-term memory as well. Let me link those. Uh, so this one's the GRU, the gated recurrence unit. This is the LSTM. And this is the uh, neural network with Keras. Uh, if you want to sign up to play around with some text stuff and get started in um, using text uh, processing APIs immediately, I dropped the link to the text API. There's 
you know, obviously there's a free trial for this. Uh, and that's usually enough to process about 20 pages of text. So for most people, that's enough to kind of play around with it. Um, was there anything else I said I would drop into the chat in terms of links? Don't think so. Oh, let me, <laughs> this one's funny. Uh, let me drop my, my results from the sports betting. I thought that was a lot of fun. That was a very like interesting, uh, uh, project. You can also do this on, um, you can also do this with, uh, stocks, by the way, which I also did. I checked out, uh, if you can do stocks, uh, with NLP based on Twitter sentiment. And I found that it was quite difficult and I found almost zero correlation. Oh, someone's paying me. Ah. Um, let me generate an invite. So this is pretty, I mean, unless anybody else has any questions, I'll wait like a few, a little bit for questions. Aren't finance doing that? Aren't they using sentiment analysis for trading? Thank you, Jim. Uh, Katya, yes. Um, they're kind of, yes and no. So JP Morgan did release a paper where they're talking about using sentiment analysis for trading. Um, but if you read the paper, uh, basically they went and they assigned words negative one, zero, and one, which is not what sentiment analysis in NLP is. NLP will like, you'll get sentiment analysis and different words and phrases. So for example, um, uh, oh gosh, I, I got to think like oxymorons. Ah, jumbo shrimp. Ah, that's not a good one for sentiment analysis. But okay, I'll take jumbo shrimp as a as a phrase, right? Uh, if you were to assign meanings to the words individually, jumbo is like huge. And you know, let's say we're talking about size of an object, that would probably give you plus one. And shrimp is small, that'll probably give you minus one. But jumbo shrimp is talking about a specific object. Um, so oxymorons kind of are weird there for different words. But yes, J.P. Morgan released a paper about this. But they basically went in and just assigned negative one, zero, and one to words, and that's not really good sentiment analysis. So if you want to do like, like you know, a real NLP kind of sentiment analysis, you get a mix of things like um, from, you get a mix of a range of scores that aren't just like three different separate scores. Um, but yes, that is being used and people are applying it uh, more and more. So would the sports betting project be considered an analysis of momentum or reputation? A winning team would have many fans posting positively on Twitter. That's a great question, Andrew. Um, I, hmm, consider an analysis of momentum or reputation. Yeah, I don't really know. I guess it would be somewhat of both. Because, uh, I mean, you know, yes, winning teams would have many fans posting positively on Twitter, but also winning teams have a lot of fans criticizing them for, other things as well. And, you know, maybe there you have players that get injured and, you know, bad things happen. Like a few, a few weeks ago we had, maybe it was just two weeks ago, we had Damar Hamlin get a heart attack in the middle of a game. Um, that was pretty bad. Um, but yes, I, I don't know. It could be, could be, could be a mix of both. I just thought it was an interesting project. Uh, and I won more than two thirds of the time. So won a little bit of money doing that. <laughs> um, Katia, thanks. Very helpful. Yes. Okay. And now I'm going to post the Discord link. So uh, if you have any further questions or if you want to chat with us uh, with me further, um, here's a link to the Discord. And there are rooms at the bottom. If you scroll to the bottom of the Discord chat, you can hop into some face-to-face -face rooms to chat with different people. Um, and this is all just self kind of like self-directed kind of stuff. You just hop in, uh, there's face-to-face -face chats, there's small groups of four people, or there's large groups of six people. Um, and you can just kind of chat and network with other people who have been here. Maybe some of the speakers, I don't know if Ayusha or Miriam are still here, um, but I will be there for a little bit. And um, yeah, that pretty much concludes this. We wrapped up an hour early. Um, if anybody has any other questions or wants to chat with me, um, you can find me there.
Thank you guys. All right. Um, I'm going to uh, hop off. Oh, wait, one thing. Make sure you guys come back tomorrow. There's another round. Okay.